Can evolutionary mechanisms explain the origin and the design of life? I meet many people who think the answer to that question is yes, and as a result of that, this becomes an excuse for them to reject belief in God, because if evolution can explain life's origin, then why is God necessary? But is this objection really valid? I'm joined today by Barry Wynn, who is a Christian and a chemical engineer to help unpack these questions. Uh, Barry, thanks for being with us again. It's great to be here, thank you. You know, you uh, are, are a chemical engineer, but you spent your career working with phosphate yes. systems, with okay. phosphates and phosphate chemistry. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the origin of life question, yes. phosphates actually play a prominent role. Right. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, just as a quick review yes. uh, for those people who maybe not are familiar with the role that phosphates play in living systems, right. why are phosphates so indispensable for life? Okay, good question. And there are really four areas uh, that we see absolute critical nature of phosphates. First of all, in cell membranes, they're made of phospholipids. Of course, phosphates is part of that. Secondly, the information molecules that store the information on how to build an organism and how to reproduce organisms, DNA and RNA, contain phosphates in their, in their structure. Third, energy storage in ATP and ADP um, is a phosphate. So phosphate is necessary just for the cells to have energy. And finally, for, for vertebrates, uh, the, the, their skeletons, their teeth, cartilage, and sinews uh, contain calcium phosphate. So that's four very important roles that phosphorus plays in living organisms and particularly uh, vertebrates. So when we're talking about the origin of life where presumably chemical systems self-organize right. into the first cell, uh, you're not going to have life if you don't have phosphates right. as, as part of your evolutionary explanation for the That's origin right. of life. So I've heard origin of life researchers refer to something called the phosphate problem. Yes. Maybe you could explain what that problem is and why it makes it difficult to think that life could originate through evolutionary mechanisms. Certainly, yes. And I think you can go, go back to tr trying to understand what the early Earth would be like. And we can imagine or have a good understanding of some of the simple gaseous molecules that would be present in the early Earth's atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen perhaps, ammonia. And a, a well-known uh, origin of life researcher, Stanley Miller, did a very a groundbreaking experiment back in 1953 when he put a simulated uh, Earth's atmosphere in, a, in glass equipment, put a spark discharge to it, and Lo and behold, some amino acids were produced. So that really sort of uh, was an uh, impetus for a lot of origin of life research in, in showing how in early Earth conditions we could perhaps um, postulate pathways to, um, to amino acids, to sugars, the fatty acids, um, and even some of the pyridines and purines, which are all based on carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and maybe oxygen. Those are all gas phase, and it can have simple molecules to begin with. But phosphorus does not exist in, in, a, in any stable gas phase compound. In fact, not even in liquid phase, it's solid minerals. And it's very difficult to see how phosphorus could have participated in the, the, um, the evolution of, of, of small prebiotic molecules to biotic molecules to biomolecules. Um, and in fact, so the problem is really a two-part. What was the source of phosphorus? Mm -hmm. And secondly, how did phosphorus become incorporated into simple mm -hmm. prebiotic molecules and then biomolecules? And uh, researchers have postulated uh, the possibility that uh, phosphorus was present either as an apatite, calcium phosphate, mm -hmm. or as a phosphide on the early Earth. And that information is based partly on the fact that meteorites are known to contain phosphates or, or phosphides. Now, if you look at the mineral um, calcium phosphate or hydroxyapatite or fluorapatite on the Earth today, most of it's associated with dead organisms, living mm -hmm. organisms, either the island deposits or the vast sedimentary deposits that are, are basically calcium fluorapatite. But um, they are not very soluble at all. And, um, People have done work trying to see how we could possibly solubilize these appetites to make them available, the phosphorus available. Um, 
but that requires usually very low pH, very aggressive low pH mineral acids. In fact, industrially, it's done only with sulfuric acid or nitric acid. And although you might solubilize the phosphorus, you'll have such aggressive conditions that a subsequent um, biomolecule formation is not likely to, to be. So, so let, let, let's just pause here for a second, right. because this is really a very important point you're making, is that if you envision phosphates on the early earth, right. they're going to be insoluble That's right. and not available. That's right. And anything that you would do to make them available would require conditions that, again, would be so harsh yes. that there's no other way, there's no way that the other reactions needed for the origin of life could take place. That's so right. what you need to make phosphates available undermines or frustrates chemical evolution. Right, but people have been um, studying it and coming up with potential sources. Now, low pH, high temperature would be very un would be very inhospitable <laughs> for any biomolecules. Likewise, very high temperature and reducing conditions mm -hmm. uh, would not be possible. Now, people have looked at like urea-based solutions to try to um, increase the solubility of phosphorus, and, and They've had some success on the bench scale, but it requires a lot of uh, research or intervention to make that happen. So phosphates is, um, is, is a mineral source to begin the um, origin of life process is not very, um, is not very hopeful. <laughs> but the, uh, the, uh, the alternative, which is phosphides, iron, nickel, um, uh, phosphide, are, are, are quite common in meteorites. And what uh, researchers have found is that this, this phosphides will corrode, if you will, in water. And, and the, the corrosion products will include um, phosphites, some metaphosphates. And some researchers have actually tried to um, phosphorylate some of the um, nucleotides mm -hmm. that um, they had some success with. But the problem was, um, first of all, there was very low yields. Secondly, it required alkaline conditions, and we think the early uh, Earth's oceans were acidic. And also the phosphorylation occurred at three different locations, and it's usually the five location, which is what mm -hmm. we expect, and, and it didn't have that, um, if you will, um, distinction yeah. in their experiments. So it's very interesting work, but it shows that if you're ever going to get a pathway, it's going to require a lot of research or intervention, right. basically controlling the reaction and making sure that it proceeds properly. So the bottom line is there's just no way that we, can, we know of today to explain how life could originate right. because there's no way to, and, and one of the problems is there's no way to get phosphate into, into living systems or the, the protocells for, right. for life to originate. Now, and so on that basis, I think people would be reasonable to say, well, maybe the origin of life requires God to intervene to bring right. it about. That would right. be the position we would hold at reasons to believe. Right. I've heard people say that that's, kind of God of the gap reasoning right? and that therefore it's not a le legitimate conclusion to say just because we can't explain right. the origin of life doesn't mean that God did it. Right. How would you respond to that, that common criticism? Yes, well I think it's a very important point we need to have a good answer for and I think that one of the answers is that the more we do research in this work, the larger the gap gets. And that gap, by that gap I mean the, the need for researcher control. Uh, to make sure that the, the chemical pathway is followed. Um, the, 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 the thesis that life so readily will form does not hold up to experimental um, testing. In fact, it is clear that a lot of researcher uh, control is required to make even these simple first steps occur. And we have not yet reached the, the complete pathway. And we may one day reach a complete pathway but it's going to show a lot of uh, researcher control being required. And in a sense, a statement that, well, we have faith that science is going to find an answer is a statement of faith, mm -hmm. just as much as we believe is the evidence for a divine mind behind the origin of life is, is a statement of faith. Well, this is really, I think, an important point that you're bringing up because as, you, as you're saying, everything that we've, we've learned over 60 plus years when yes. it comes to origin of life indicates that if the chemistry is going to work, intelligent agents, that is organic chemists are needed yes. Yes. to make it work. Right. 
And so we're not just simply saying that there's no explanation for the origin of life, therefore God did it. That's right. But we're saying is that the problems seem to point us towards the role of intelligent agency. And as we talked about in, in the last episode, yes. we also see design, that, that there's something special about, in this case, phosphates. That's right. So it's not just God of the gaps, but it's there's positive reasons why we think that design or mind is the best explanation. That's absolutely right, yes. 